Now, over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the teachings of Jesus in Luke chapter 14, Luke uh, 15, and now uh, the last couple of weeks in Luke 16. Now, last week, we listened in on Jesus using a parable about a manager who embezzled his master's funds, and he used that parable to teach his disciples about the true value of money and how we need to now understand our temporal circumstances with an eternal perspective. Now, after Jesus taught this lesson, notice what happens next. And if you have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 16, uh, take a look at verse 14. It says, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. Now, remember that he, Jesus, had just told them that the way you use your money can make or break your eternal destiny. He pointed out to them that whatever, whether you have an eternal home will depend, at least in part anyways, on whether you use your money to advance the kingdom of God in the lives of others or whether you used it to advance your comforts and or your status symbols. And that's the point of verse 11 where he says, if then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches uh, as what we took a look at last week. In other words, the possession of money in this world is a test run for eternity. And the question we we're, were left with last week was this, can you pass the test of faithfulness with your money? Do you use it as a means of proving the worth of God and the joy you have in supporting his cause? Or does the way you use it prove that what you really enjoy is things or money, or status, or position, not God. So, the Pharisees, they hear all of this, and they begin to mock Jesus, not because Jesus missed the point, and so that they can now make fun of him publicly, but rather because Jesus had touched a nerve. You see, beneath all of their religious veneer, and that religious veneer looked shiny, and it looked good, it looked perfectly in place, but behind all of that and underneath all this religious veneer, they, they love money most. And Jesus saw it and he nailed it. And he said to them, verse 15 of this chapter, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Did not make these guys happy at all. Because he exposes them, and so they try to justify themselves instead of repent, which would have opened the way to receive Jesus for who he really is, the radical teacher of righteousness. They missed it. They didn't get it. The Pharisees instead tried to justify themselves by making Jesus look foolish in front of the crowd. It didn't work. Now, with that understanding of the situation, for us to think about, Jesus now begins to teach the Pharisees another lesson to drive home the point that our position in the kingdom of God is because of the grace of God and not about position or money or status. So let's now jump into verse 19 where we're presented with a rich man who, as it says, was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. Now, Jesus starts this parable with a really, really rich guy because the Pharisees could identify with him. He, he's one of their own. In the ancient Jewish culture, by the way, if you were rich, uh, you, you would have been seen as being blessed by God and so would be envied and honored by those who weren't rich and, for that matter, by those who were rich. But this man is depicted as not just rich, but extravagantly rich or filthy rich, as we would probably say today. And so would be seen by the public as a man who was, this guy's generously blessed by God. This guy, God must love this man. And so that's how they would see it and understand it. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, would view this man, you see, as, as a hero, uh, as, as somebody touched by God. Then Jesus goes on, though, and he continues in verses 20 and 21, where we meet a poor man with a disease of sores. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, 
who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. This is painting a really depressing, uh, decrepit picture of somebody who was not blessed by God. This guy must be cursed by God. So, so far, the Pharisees are agreeing with Jesus, and they're going, hey, we kind of like this story. We like where it's going. They just don't know where it ends. So anyways, the inevitable end comes to both, as it's going to end for every single one of us, by the way, unless Jesus returns, they die. The poor man goes to paradise, where Abraham is, and the rich man goes to hell, where there's fire and torment. Verse 22, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Now this begs the question. What does Jesus want the Pharisees, and by the way, it's written for us as well to learn something. What does he want them and us to know? Well, the first thing I see here is that nothing about us saves us. Nothing about us saves us. By the way, notice that there is no record of the poor man being buried. Did you notice that? As a beggar, he probably didn't have a, a decent burial. Instead, his body would have probably been tossed into a valley. It's a valley that's it's called Hinnom, uh, just outside of Jerusalem, where they had these continuous fires burning, uh, burning up all the garbage there, and, and burning up anything that would have been deemed unclean, including the bodies of executed criminals and, and, and individuals who couldn't afford a proper burial, such as beggars. Pharisees would have been absolutely shocked, though, as Jesus described this beggar, instead of having his body picked up by the garbage collectors of the city and thrown into the fire. One, he was instead, he was transported by angels. Whoa. And secondly, not only was he transported by angels, but he was transported by these angels to, to Abraham's side. These two things would have been absolutely unthinkable in their mind because they considered this poor guy, this beggar, to be cursed by God, not blessed. But what Jesus is doing here, he's using symbolic language. He's making it plain that the poor man was actually blessed by God. And not only blessed, but he was blessed in a big way. In fact, he was saying to these Pharisees who thought themselves all of that, that they were the best Jews around, that this poor man, this beggar, was more of a Jew than the rich man was by being brought directly with an honor guard to the heavenly banquet. See, these Pharisees listening would have immediately hated the story at this point. I don't like the story anymore. They would have had to see a picture in their minds of the traditional banquet feast of their day. They would have got this and understood it uh, uh, because at a banquet in their culture, the guests reclined at the table. They didn't have chairs like we have when we sit around a big mahogany table and, and have chairs with plates. And they would actually have their plates probably in the center on the ground or big bowls that, that they would share together on the ground. And then they would lay, recline on the ground around with their feet on the outside. And they would uh, recline in such a manner that you could lean back onto the breast of the one that was near you to then be able to engage in intimate conversation. And understanding that, go back and read the Last Supper of how uh, those uh, disciples were in relation to Jesus. Very interesting, by the way. But Lazarus, we're, we're talking about Lazarus right now. And, he, and Lazarus is pictured at the banquet. Guess where he is? Right next to Abraham, the father of the faith, enjoying rest and comfort and fellowship delivered from the trials that he had known all of his life. Jesus is using symbolism here because, of course, we go to eternity to be with Jesus, our Savior, not Abraham himself personally, but the symbolism isn't lost on the Pharisees. Here, the man they thought cursed is actually blessed by God, and, and now he, he's invited to be in, in a place where there's no more begging, no more sores, no more outside the gate, no more crumbs to fend for, no more hunger the true Jew in the story is Lazarus, the poor man. Now compare that to the rich man calling out now in verse 24. Father, Abraham. You notice those two words. 
In other words, this guy is also a Jew. Just like Lazarus, he's a Jew living life before their death. But the, here, here's the thing. His Jewishness didn't save him. He, he's not even seen by Abraham as his son. Ouch. Now, do you remember what John the Baptist, we've been looking at Mark and, and, and also the beginning of Luke, John the Baptist, do you remember what he preached at the beginning of the Gospels? In Luke 3, he says, bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Sometimes do you ever read the words of Jesus and you go, where in the world are you going? Like it's, sometimes it's like he does these double turns on us. So what's he talking about here? Well, he actually makes sense. Let me explain it to you. The rich man in the parable is one of those who presumed to say, I'm secure as a child of Abraham. But he showed no fruit that proved repentance at all. You see, he shared no clothes. He shared no food. He shared nothing with this poor man at the gate. Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. He didn't do that, did he? And so what happened is the axe fell. Now he's in hell. You can't help but see the connection with the ridicule the Pharisees had thrown back at Jesus in verse 14 when they're basically saying, listen, Jesus, we're the children of Abraham, so don't threaten us with that, the use of our money changing our spiritual destiny. Don't be so presumptuous, Jesus. What do you know anyways? What they haven't seen or, or understood was what the Apostle Peter later goes on around telling everybody who'd listen. Wherever he went, Paul would explain that God through, yeah, you'll find this in Titus 3, where through Christ saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, our righteousness meaning our social standing or our heritage or our money or, or our good works. Christ saved us not because of works done by us in, in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through who? Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we then, we who are saved, might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We are now the true Jew, unlike this rich man. You see, these Pharisees, they did not recognize God's grace and his willingness to grant forgiveness to anyone honest enough to admit that they need God in their lives, that at their core, they're morally flawed and in need of, of a savior. They didn't understand that it isn't because they were born Jewish or, or even that they were hard workers at being good that saved them. They didn't understand that nothing about us saves us. Nothing about them saves them. That we only can be saved through faith. You see, church, it didn't make any difference that the rich man thought he had a secure standing as a son of Abraham. The rich man now is in hell because he believed his money and position and lineage was what guaranteed his spot in heaven and not in his relationship with God. And, and we see this in that he delighted more in luxuries for himself than in love for God, expressed then in his love for the Lazaruses of the world. Every day he came in and out through his gate. For Lazarus sat and waited for even a crumb of bread. Secondly, what we see here is that hell is actually a real eternal place. Let's go to verse 23 and 26 of Luke 16. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now... He is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, 
a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. Here's, here's the thing. This rich man had chosen to exclude God in his life while he was living. He didn't need, or for that matter, want God because he had what he wanted while on earth. And, and so we see God actually granting the rich man his wish. God is a gentleman, and he will not force himself on anyone. And if we choose not to walk with him, he won't force the walk. We choose not to be with him, he will not force the, the, the time spent. We see God granting the rich man his wish, just like he does with all of those who choose to ignore or fend off or push God away from any of his invitations. God still invites, but we have to accept that invitation. Hell exists so that people who choose to exclude God from their lives could actually have what they wish for. After all, if you don't want God in your life for a short time now, why do you change your mind in order to have him for all eternity after you die? It, it, think about this. I don't want God around my life. I don't want him present. If, if, if that is uh, as the uh, rich man has been thinking all his life. But in heaven, he is everywhere present and everywhere discernible. Everywhere. There's no place in heaven that his light doesn't shine into. But in hell, he's deliberately absent and far off in order to respect the choice of those who have chosen against him. But, he, but the rich man, uh, he never really thought about the consequences of his choice. He never consciously verbalized to himself that pushing God away throughout his life while he was here on earth would mean he would spend eternity without him. He's surprised when he finds himself in this terrible place. And so, according to Jesus, he begins to have this dialogue with Abraham about fixing what's gone wrong. Verse 24, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Now, why does he address Abraham as father? I think this rich guy just never imagined that his afterlife destination was hell. And I think he thought, listen, hey, Father Abraham, I, I'm a good guy. I, I'm from an affluent family. I have lots of friends, lots of the Pharisees I know personally. I, I, don't, I don't cheat on my wife. I, I, I don't even shortchange the waiter. I, I, or I, I certainly don't cheat on my income taxes. Basically, I'm a good guy. Certainly, in fact, I'm probably considered by many quite a likable guy. I think he also saw, thought this, it, that even if my social status and nice guyness didn't get me in, I, I'm, I'm a descendant of Abraham after all. Uh, so I'm going to get in based on my lineage, based on who I'm related to. It's not what you know, it's who you know. So he calls out, Father, Abraham, hey, Father, we're related. In other words, I'm your descendant. Have mercy on me. I, I should be down here. So you know what? We got connections. Maybe you can fix this. So how does Abraham answer? Verse 25, but Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. So Abraham reminds him, he says, listen, uh, during this, your time on earth, you pursued after things instead of God, after luxury for yourself instead of love for others. And because of that, earth was your heaven. So eternity is going to be your hell. But for Lazarus, it's going to be the opposite. Then as we saw in verse 26, he adds, besides all, all of this, besides the fact of your own love for money and your lovelessness towards Lazarus, which consigns you to hell, besides all of this, between us and you is a great chasm that's been fixed. No one can cross from there to us. There's no way we can get across. In other words, any thought of a temporary purgatory is out of the question. Death is absolutely final. The bed we make in this life, we sleep in forever. You can't miss in this story the permanency of the afterlife, church. Listen, please understand that hell is a real place that separates us from the presence of God, the source of all spiritual light and 
all joy and all wisdom and all love or uh, an all good thing of any sort. And since we were originally created uh, for God's immediate presence, only in his face, only in his presence will we thrive, where, where we'll flourish, and where we can ever hope to achieve our highest potential. If we were to lose his presence totally, that would be the deepest darkness of our soul. Without his light, we can only expect the loss of our capability for giving, or receiving, or love or of joy. Add that to the picture of the fire of hell, which speaks to fire's nature as, as what? It's, as a, it's a disintegrator, isn't it? You throw anything in a fire and eventually disintegrates, burns up if it's hot enough. Even in this life, we can see the kind of soul disintegration that self-centeredness creates, can't we? We know how selfishness and self-preoccupation leads to piercing bitterness, nauseating envy, paralyzing anxiety, paranoid thoughts, mental denials and distortions that just accompany them. Hell, then, is the fire or the disintegration of a soul by living a self-absorbed, self-centered, angst-driven, anxiety-filled, blame-shifting life going on and on forever. Don't even want to imagine that. Notice that the rich man, unlike Lazarus, has never given a personal name. He's only called a rich man, which I think strongly hints that since he has built his identity on his, on his wealth rather than God, once he lost his wealth, he lost any sense of self at all. We see this happening. We see this, uh, this process in a small way in, in addictions to things like drugs and alcohol and gambling and pornography. First, there is the disintegration because as time goes on and marches on, continues on, you need more and more of the addictive substance, whatever that might be, to get an equal quick kick, uh, kick, which leads to less and less satisfaction. And then you add on to that the, the isolation as increasingly you begin to blame others and circumstances in order to justify your behavior. That's just on earth. But imagine in eternity this disintegration going on forever. In eternity, there's this increasing isolation and denial and delusion and self-interest. You don't have any friends in hell because everybody is self-interested. And this is continuous and increasing, this, this disintegration forever. That's why we need to get rid of everything and anything that would... That would, that would uh, bring us into a place, the same place as the rich man. We've got to get rid of those things that get in the way. From, from moving towards paradise and pushing us into hell. And, and what is it really that gets in the way? It's the love of money that gets in the way, according to Jesus. It's the love of money, or, or, or maybe we can say the love of what we think money gets us that gets in the way. You see, money's a tool. Uh, money itself is not evil. It's just a tool. It's the love of money that gets in the way. But it, it, and it's never a substitute for God's care. You see, it gets in the way when we try to find our security in money instead of finding our security in God. We, pleasures of life instead of the pleasures found in God. Attempting to find power in money instead of submitting to the only power in the universe that matters, God. Comforts instead of finding our comfort in God. Relying on money for our needs instead of relying on God for our every need. Now at this point, the rich man asks us if Abraham will send Lazarus to warn his five brothers uh, about the danger of hell. Evidently, this rich man knew that they were pursuing the same kind of life that he had been pursuing. And, and so he knows that they're doomed. And he goes, I, okay, I get it, I understand. I, I accept the fact that I can never get out of here. But go tell these guys. And what does Abraham answer in verse 29? He says, well, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Hmm. In other words, God had already provided ample information and evidence about the necessity of love and the danger of judgment. He'd already provided that. But the rich man knows that his brothers don't listen to the scriptures. Oh, 
they might have devotions in the morning. They may go to the synagogue every Saturday and every Sabbath. But he knows that their whole mindset about money is shaped by the world and not by the word. So the rich man knows it's not going to do any good for Abraham just to say to them, read your Bible, pray every day, read Moses, read the prophets. He knows that's not going to work with these guys. So he advises Abraham, here he is in hell, and he's advising Abraham how to get his brothers to repent. He says in verse 30, no father Abraham, but if somebody goes to them from the dead, then they will repent. I guarantee it. Of course they will. If there could just be a resurrection from the dead, something really startling, some, some miracle, then they'd wake up and they'd repent. I know it. They'd forsake their selfish luxury and they'd start to live for others all to the glory of God. So go tell them, get raised, you raise somebody from the dead. Then comes Abraham's final, utterly stunning statement in verse 31. He said to him, listen, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced is someone that should rise from the dead. Wow, isn't that incredible? If a person is so in love with money that he, he's deaf to the commands and warnings of the promises of Moses and, and the prophets, then even a resurrection from the dead won't bring about repentance. So, suppose Jesus should rise from the dead. And this is what Luke wants his readers to think about. See, Luke's looking back at the story, and he wants us to think about this. And Jesus knew, for foretelling what he was going to happen to him. He knew. And suppose he should reveal himself to five brothers like these. Will they receive him for who he is? Or they might be utterly knocked out of their senses by the miracle of an irrefutable resurrection. But the question is, will they be knocked out of their sins? Will they repent? Well, what does Abraham say? Abraham says, no, they'll, they'll not repent. And why not? What will keep them from receiving Jesus for the financial radical that he really is? You know what it is? The love of money. In other words, church, if we use our money to fatten our cushions instead of seeking every way possible to invest in the hope of others, and if our love for money and things is so deep that the writings of Moses and the prophets of God do not change our values then we will not be changed even if Jesus should rise from the dead and if Jesus should walk into this room. We'll not receive him for who he really is unless we see him for who he is. So church, I encourage each of us to take a good hard look at the Son of God and see Jesus for who he is. You see, seeing Jesus for who he is is crucial if we're serious about looking at the life to come. Now, a superficial reading of the story might lead you to conclude, and I don't want you to conclude this, that a person who's rich and comfortable in this life goes to hell. You know, oh, I'm rich, I'm going to hell. No, it's not saying that. Well, the person who's poor and miserable goes to heaven to kind of even things out. Got to get the balances correct in, in the karma of this world. I mean, that would actually contradict scriptures and even in the story itself, you've got to remember the very, very, very wealthy Abraham is in heaven. The rich man's problem wasn't that he was rich, but that he did not repent of his sin of squandering his riches on himself instead of using them as God would have had him to do. Remember we said last week, to make friends for eternity. When we seriously look at the life to come, we don't really get a complete look until we see Jesus for who he is. And who is he? He is the one who saves. On the cross, Jesus' sacrifice was scarcely describable. How do you describe his crucifixion, this bloody, disfigured remnant of a man who was given a cross that was perhaps recycled, more than likely, likely covered in the blood and the feces and the urine of other men, who had used it previously. It was a terrible place. It was a terrible sight. Hanging there in immense pain, he slowly suffocated to death, all the while knowing he would end this. He could end the suffering right then and there, calling legions of angels, but choosing not to for a benefit. And that's not even the worst part. 
Worst part was the separation from the Father that Jesus felt. It was a separation that, that because he's separated from the only light that he's known for eternity is like hell itself. In Matthew uh, 27, in fact, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It tore his soul when that happened, church. Some people might say, yeah, well, I, I, I know I get that, but I, I'm not all that bad. I haven't murdered somebody after all. God's going to be fair and he's going to let me into heaven because I kind of tried hard on most days, some days, okay, a couple times. But Jesus didn't say that the greatest commandment is not to murder or not to commit adultery. What Jesus did say was that the greatest commandment is what? To love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love God with everything you got. The problem, though, is that there is no greater evidence of the inability of humanity to obey God's law than this one commandment. Spend five hours with Steve Savage and you'll see that happen. No human being with a fallen nature could possibly love God with all his heart and his soul and his strength 24 hours a day. It is humanly impossible. That's why we need to repent often, forgive freely, and extend grace continuously because it ain't going to happen in our lives perfectly. And as a result, that means we're all condemned by our inability to fulfill just the one command. We can't even do one command. That's the reason Jesus continually reminded the Pharisees of their inability to keep the law of God. He was trying to get them. Because, yes, he actually loved the Pharisees. We think he hated the Pharisees. He loved them. He wanted them to see their, that there was hope for them, too. He was trying to get them to see their utter spiritual bankruptcy and their need for a Savior, just like he wants us to see. But when we see Jesus for who he is, as, as the one who saves, and not just saves the world, but saves me. Saves you. And not just from eternal damnation, but he saves you from yourself. And from those moments in life when you fail again. And when you fail again. And he saves us. He is the one who saves and we receive this free, free gift of salvation offered by his sacrifice on the cross. And, and when we have been cleansed from sin and we receive the spirit of holiness, the impossible happens. That being a transformation of our hearts and our minds to love God as we've been commanded to. This, this church is great news. God's love does not compel him to eliminate the necessary punishment and consequences for our sin, but instead... It compels him to offer us a way to avoid the consequences altogether. By offering forgiveness through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, God demonstrated his love for us. This week, this week, church, I want to challenge each of you, myself included, any of us who have committed our life to Jesus Christ, to tell someone that Jesus wants to have a relationship with them. Listen, don't keep the news to yourself. This is great news. Let's not allow somebody to be like the rich man in hell and say, I'm going to be an evangelist now. Go tell these five brothers of mine. Let's do it now while we're here living on this earth. Let's go tell our brothers. Let's go tell our sisters this great news that there is somebody who was raised from the dead and his name is Jesus and he is our savior. Help others take a look at the life to come instead of only looking at this life today. Because guess what happens in this life today? It eventually will lead to death. It's the only, the only place it will ever end. Whereas our future with Jesus Christ will go on into eternity. And for those who don't know Jesus as their Savior, I don't know where you are spiritually today. If you don't know Jesus, I invite you to take a serious look at the life to come and accept this offer of salvation. And once our hearts all of our hearts have been transformed. We no longer see hell as a problem. We see heaven as the goal. And not only a goal for ourselves, but church, it's a goal to share.